The turbocharger was originally invented and designed to assist with propulsion on both naval and container ships in the early 1900s. And you fast forward to the late 30s, they were actually used on warplanes to help with the war effort. And it wasn't until the early 60s with vehicles like the Corvair, where we saw mass production of vehicles coming off the line with turbochargers. Now today in 2023, we see that the vast majority of especially four and six cylinder vehicles are coming off that line now with one, even two turbochargers in some cases. So that's what we're gonna talk about today and welcome to the October edition of the s and Power Hour. Uh, we'll get right into it and we're gonna talk about a few important things here. So what we're gonna talk about is understanding turbocharger operation, very basic, low level. Uh, we're gonna understand wastegate operation, again, at a very basic and low level. And then we're gonna talk about some common issues and failures or DTCs that you may find coming through your shops every day. Uh, again, we say a low level, but you know we have 30 minutes here. Generally speaking, we could spend hours on both operation, wastegate operation and common issues, but we're gonna talk about some of the most common things that you may wanna know in your shops today. So at the most basic level, and that's what we definitely wanna to get to is the most basic level, a turbocharger consists of just three major components, the turbine wheel, the compressor wheel, and the bearing system that supports the turbine shaft that connects the turbine and compressor wheels together. Now the turbine wheel is responsible for converting heat and pressure into rotational force. And high pressure from the exhaust manifold will always seek low pressure. And as the exhaust exits the cylinders and flows to the exhaust, it spins that turbine wheel and converts kinetic energy into rotation. As the turbine wheel rotates, it spins the turbine shaft, which in turn spins the compressor wheel, which we'll show you here in just a moment. Now, like the turbine wheel, the compressor section, the compressor section is made up of two primary components, the compressor wheel and the compressor cover. Now the compressor's job is to compress fresh air and funnel it towards the throttle body. And since it's connected directly to the turbine wheel via the turbine shaft, the compressor wheel rotates at the same RPM as the turbine wheel. And as the engine and turbine wheel accelerate, so does the compressor wheel. And this process creates pressure in the intake, which is called boost. As the wheel spins, it takes ambient air, rotates it 90 degrees along the blade of the wheels, and forces it into the compressor cover where it is collected and then forced into the intake tube. Now, a critical part of the turbocharger is the housing and bearing section. I'll show you that in just a moment. And it serves as the mounting point for both housings and must be made of a substantial material to handle the heat and stress of the turbine. The housing supports and lubricates the turbocharger bearings with turbine shaft speeds in excess of 100,000 RPMs. And the bearing's job is much, much more difficult than that of say a traditional camshaft bearing. So turbocharger manufacturers have spent a lot of time and money building serious bearings that can handle the excess speeds and heat that are accompanied with it. And understanding the turbocharger works by compressing air, it is easy to see why an intercooler is important. We'll talk about that in just a second. So with that, we need to also talk about a wastegate system. Uh, turbochargers have to have these, and a wastegate is simply a device that bleeds off exhaust gas before it reaches the, the inlet of the turbine housing. Now, if a turbo system did not have a wastegate, the turbine would see all of the exhaust throughout the engine's operating range, and boost would continue to rise uncontrollably until either the throttle was shut or the turbine wheel reached its choke point. And for most engines, this would create an excessive amount of boost or airflow and destroy a lot of parts. And so to control the boost and engine power, turbocharger systems rely on wastegates, which are mounted before the turbine housing are inside of it in the case of say, a uh, percentage of exhaust gas to make sure it regulates the turbine speed and boost. Now, wastegate designs vary, but in the most simplistic terms, every wastegate features an inlet and an outlet port to which the exhaust gases may enter. And a valve that regulates the flow of exhaust gas through the inlet port and a spring diaphragm actuator, which controls the valve opening and closing. Now under normal driving conditions, the wastegate valve remains closed and all exhaust gas is sent directly to the turbine housing. As boost pressure rises, pressure acts upon the spring assembly and begins to lift the valve, diverting exhaust flow away from the turbine and controlling turbine speed to regulate boost pressure. 
And just to show a little more clarity of that, and because I'll take any excuse and opportunity I can to use a tiny hand on a stick, I'll show you that on the screen here. So here's what we have. We have our exhaust valve open. It's allowing those hot, fast exhaust gases to leave and go past the turbine housing. And that's gonna move the exhaust out of the vehicle. But as it's doing so, it's spinning that turbine wheel very fast, again, upwards of 100,000 RPMs. And here on the other side, because of that, it's also moving our compressor wheel very quickly, bringing in that fresh air. And so the wastegate system, again, is going to be connected on the exhaust side. And as this exhaust is coming out, it's going to operate open or closed depending on the level of exhaust and boost that is building. If there's too much boost, it's going to relieve some of that boost and it's going to come back through the exhaust, keeping that turbine wheel from speeding up too fast. And that hopefully gives you a little bit more clarity on how that works. Now, before I go to the next slide, let me come to the table here and I'll show you, we've been talking about the turbine wheel and the compressor wheel in the housing. And this is what that looks like. Now they're gonna be different in sizes. They're gonna vary depending on the vehicle, but essentially the system is, we have the shell of the turbo. We all know what that looks like. We have the electronics of the turbo that control or are monitored by the PCM, whichever the case is. But at the heart of it, the main function of the turbo is right here. Here's our turbine wheel that's going to spin with those hot exhaust gases coming out. And on the other side, we have our compressor wheel that's gonna turn at the same rate of speed, bringing that fresh air in. And both of these are connected with, the, again, those bearings we talked about and a center shaft. And it's important to note that center shaft in some cases is incredibly small and very susceptible to heat damage and especially if there's low lubricity in the system, wear damage. So keep in mind, if this is gonna spin up to close to 100,000 RPMs at times, we gotta make sure we have proper lubrication and that the heat is getting out the way it's supposed to, or we will have a quick failure on the shaft and the bearing system that houses the turbine wheel and the compressor wheel. And so that's the basic understanding of how a turbocharger works. But when we talk about wastegate, we also have to talk about the PCM controlled boost. Now, in the first example, we were talking essentially of a mechanical or a vacuum actuated wastegate system. In this scenario, we have the same setup. We still have a turbine wheel and a compressor wheel, exhaust going out, air coming in, and a wastegate controlling that boost. The only difference is it's now PCM controlled. And as with the basic turbo system, a pressure actuator is gonna control the wastegate valve opening. Now the wastegate opens when the boost pressure exp exceeds the spring tension, just like the previous screen. Uh, but since the engine control system can monitor many inputs, such as say engine knock, intake air, and engine temperature, manifold pressure, or boost, the boost pressure itself can safely be increased above the spring tension of the wastegate. And the turbocharger wastegate is gonna be controlled by the PCM through the pulse width modulated turbocharger wastegate regulating valve solenoid. That's a long term, but that's what it is. And this solenoid allows some of the boost pressure to bleed atmosphere, keeping the wastegate closed. So again, we have our same system, exhaust out, air in. We have our wastegate controlling that boost pressure. The only difference is now we have the PCM monitoring multiple components and PIDs to determine when that bent solenoid needs to do its job to control the wastegate. So fairly simple. Now, we discussed intercoolers briefly, and I'm gonna to touch on it just one more time here. Regardless of what type of turbo system you have, we have to have a charge air cooler. The intercooler or charge air cooler removes the heat generated by compressing the air. We're bringing in a lot of air. We're compressing a ton of air at 100,000 RPMs. So we have to be able to remove that heat. And intercoolers can be can, you know, easily contaminated with oil if the engine has a problem. Um, and then the seams can also separate, causing a leak. And any leak on the pressure side has a large impact on boost. And if we look at our screen here, again, we got our radiator, we have our charge air cooler, our intercooler. And when we look at this on the front of the car, we can look at it almost identical to that of a condenser on an AC. Same thing holds true. We're removing heat and in cases of catastrophic failure, like with AC, uh, the same thing holds true on an intercooler. If we have a catastrophic failure of a turbocharger, it's vital that we replace the intercooler along with the turbocharger, because in pretty much all cases, it's almost impossible to flush a condenser. 
So we don't want to introduce debris from the condenser, or not the condenser, but the intercooler back to the new turbo if that's what we've had to do. Now that's the basic turbo, basic wastegate system, PCM control wastegate system, and the intercooler, but we'd be remiss if we didn't at least bring up variable geometry turbochargers, which are on the rise and being used in a lot of vehicles now. And the variable geometry turbo is an electronically controlled turbo by the vehicle's PCM, and it's hydraulically actuated using pressurized lube oil. Now, it may also be referred to as electronic variable response turbocharger, but we'll keep it VGT for short. And the VGT uses a turbine wheel that's very similar to what I just showed you on that housing where we have a turbine on one side and a compressor on the other side, but the turbine housing has changed. In a VGT system, the turbine housing also contains veins that control the effective internal size of the housing. And these veins are hydraulically actuated and electronically controlled. And when the veins of the turbocharger are closed, the engine will have a higher exhaust back pressure and create more heat, which will in turn warm the engine faster in colder ambient conditions. And I'll show you that on the table here. This is, just happens to be an example of a VGT turbo off of a 6.7 Cummins. And as we see here, we have our compressor side and then we have our turbine side. Now, it doesn't look that different except for we have these veins going around the turbine wheel. And those are actuated by an armature here that is connected to a solenoid. And that solenoid is going to move that armature back and forth, effectively changing the size of the turbine housing. As you can see, when it's down and when it's up, the effective amount of flow that comes through the turbine housing is changed. And we got to make sure on a system that has a VGT turbo that we don't have excessive carbon buildup. Excessive carbon buildup can cause this vein system to seize. And so even if our actuator is doing its job, it may be locked and not able to push those veins up or down because of carbon buildup. The same thing holds true with the actuator itself, which is a very common failure and something you may want to look for when you have these in. If the actuator fails, obviously the armature is not going to move and we're not going to have that change in the veins. And so if that happens, whether it's the solenoid that goes bad or the carbon buildup is causing a sticking situation with the veins, we're either gonna have too much or too little exhaust back pressure at the times that we need it. And that's really the basic uh, kind of rundown of a, v a VGT turbo. Again, we could spend a lot more time talking about that, but that is the basics of it. Still controlled by the PCM, just has a little bit different housing. So we know the understanding of a basic turbo, how it works, pretty understand, basic understanding of how the wastegate system works and a little bit about VGT turbos. But let's talk about some of the typical things that you may have come through your shop on a daily basis. Generally speaking, the most common reasons a turbo is either suspected bad or a failure or a customer's complaint leads to a turbo is usually going to be around either an underboost condition, an overboost condition with corresponding codes of 0299 and 0234, or you may end up having solenoid circuit codes or range and performance codes. These are the most typical codes that you'll see coming through when there's a turbo related issue. Now, causes of underboost, there's plenty of other things that we could talk about, but the most common reasons we see underboost is going to be that either the wastegate is stuck open or there could just be a leak between the turbo and the engine. And what I mean by that is an air leak between the turbo outlet and the engine air intake. You know, in that case, if that happens, it may just be that someone changed an air filter, didn't tighten something back down right, and there's you know, not adequate airflow coming through. Something easy to fix. Obviously, if it's a wastegate stuck open, we're gonna have to look at the wastegate operation and make sure it's functioning properly. Now, on the other side of that, if we have an overboost condition, Instead of being stuck open, we're going to find that we probably have a wastegate that's either stuck closed, a control hose that's either leaking or disconnected, or possibly a wastegate vent solenoid stuck in the vent position. And I'll come to the table here real quick, and I'll show you an example of how that wastegate being stuck closed can happen. So this was off of a 1.6 liter EcoBoost engine, and the customer complaint was the vehicle at about 50 miles an hour you could just smash the gas all the way to the floor, and all of a sudden, we didn't have any power. It was like it was bogged down or going into limp mode. It just wouldn't go any faster or have any more power involved. So we got the car on the lift, we looked underneath it, and I'm sure you've seen this a thousand times in your shops. Guess what was missing from underneath the vehicle? That's right, the skid plate. 
the protective cover that keeps road debris from jumping up and hitting the bottom side of the engine and external components around the engine. And that's exactly what happened with this EcoBoost. We start looking around, we saw we had an overboost condition code. So we go straight to the wastegate solenoid, we check the hoses and sure enough, right in the middle of this hose, there's a huge split. And it's because something popped up and hit the bottom side of the engine because we didn't have protection there. That alone was enough to not send the correct information to the PCM because this is vacuum. You know, that if we lose vacuum here, it's not going to report things properly. So the PCM didn't know what was going on, and therefore the wastegate was not being operated by the PCM because this solenoid was not functioning properly and it wasn't sending the right signal. So that's a real good example of what can happen with an overboost condition and a simple fix on this one. And we'll show you some more things that were a simple fix on this one because this engine got hit by a lot of stuff because there was no protective plate. Could just be a line that needs to be replaced. So there's some causes of overboost. Now, when you have a customer come in with a vehicle that is turbocharged and their complaint is low power, there's some easy things we can look for. Maybe it's a dirty air cleaner. Maybe it's the air intake system restriction. Uh, maybe it's an intake leak. Maybe it's an exhaust restriction. Uh, or it could just be that the turbocharger is damaged or worn. And I'll show you a, a quick way to test some of those uh, turbos. It's not foolproof, but it helps sometimes. And the same thing holds true if it's a diesel and you have a low power complaint, but also excess smoke. Um, again, we need to check and make sure we don't have a dirty air cleaner, an air intake system restriction, a leak between the turbo and intake, or maybe a wastegate mechanism and a, a possibly a turbocharger that's damaged. So again, if we come back to the table, we will talk about, I'm trying to figure out where it went, y'all. I apologize. Um, where did my component go? Oh, I have it on the table and I apologize for that. So another quick way that we can test and see if we have a worn or damaged turbo, and I had this sitting here the whole time, uh, now, this, again, is not foolproof. Unfortunately, it, we don't have access to them on every vehicle, like some. However, if we have a turbo that we are suspecting that might be worn or damaged, one thing that we can do, if we have access to the compressor side, and, and a lot of vehicles do, but sometimes they're tucked pretty far down, you can't get to it. But if you have access to the compressor side of the turbo, remove the downpipe and get your hand on the shaft of the compressor wheel. And one thing you can do is, one, spin it, see how much movement you have. If there's a restriction and you're having to actually force it to turn, we may have um, something seizing up inside, whether it's the bearing or the shaft is bent, something like that. Another thing you can do is jiggle it. See how much play you have. Uh, one thing that can cause a lot of damage to turbos is as these shafts wear out, the play can become so excessive that it'll actually touch the side of the turbine housing. And if that happens, it's going to damage the wheel. It's also going to cause a lot of sluggish issues and low power issues. And so by checking the play and checking the movement of the shaft, we can kind of determine how much, you know, may you wear or damage is done to the turbo. And again, it's not foolproof, but it's one way to check before you start tearing everything apart. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not something else going on, but you can at least rule out some very common things. So that's a one quick way to check and see if you have an issue with a worn out turbo. Now, when we do have turbo damage or a worn out turbo, some of the things that we're gonna find as pretty much common complaints are things that we're gonna see more often is we're gonna have a customer complaining about noisy or whistling sounds coming from the turbo. And often the noise is gonna come from an air, geese, uh, an air gas leakage due to pre-turbine exhaust gas or an air boost leak. Check all your joints there, check all your hose connections and everything, make sure they're tight. And if they are, and the noise continues, check the turbocharger clearances and wheels for housing contact. So again, what I talked about there is if that shaft is, is kind of worn out and it's allowing the compressor or turbine wheel to contact the housing, we're gonna have noisy whistling and some other issues like seize and sluggish. And if the turbocharger rotor assembly has seized or is tight to rotate, this is often due to lubricating oil degradation, which can cause a high buildup of carbon like we talked about on the VGT, but it will build it up in the bearing housing interior and that'll restrict rotation. And in, you know, if we have insufficient or an intermittent drop in oil pressure, that can easily cause the rotor to seize, as can introducing dirt and oil into the lubricating oil. 
and obviously worn out, excessive uh, clearance issues can just be um, kind of what I was talking about when I had the, the center housing in my hand there. You got to remember a turbocharger has a specific axial and radial rotor clearance. And these are sometimes misdiagnosed as worn bearings. If the clearances are out of specification, the cause could actually be attributed to the lubricating oil and there being a problem with it. So it could be either insufficient oil or dirt or some other type of contamination in the system, coolant, what have you. So those are the most common reasons that we see noisy, seized, and worn turbo systems. Some of the reasons for that can come down to um, some very easy things. Again, insufficient oil supply or return is the most common. Um, and if we look on the screen here, we'll see what the effects of using silicone sealants will do. Silicone sealants are going to expand and in most cases restrict the flow of oil to the turbo. Um, and unless otherwise noted by service information, we shouldn't be using silicone sealants when we're putting turbos back in. And because of that insufficient flow of a sealant, it can cause damage to both the wheels, the compressor R, the turbine wheel, or the shaft itself. And then dirty oil damages the turbocharger by causing heavy scoring of critical bearing surfaces. This is, this is not a good thing when it comes to a turbocharger, again, spinning upwards of 100,000 RPMs. And so to avoid damage, we gotta make sure we're doing proper oil and filters. They need to be quality oil and filters and preferably recommended by the engine manufacturer. And these should be changed when a new tur turbocharger is fitted and at regular intervals. So again, at regular intervals, but also if we're replacing a turbo, we definitely need to be doing an oil change as well as an air filter change. Uh, dirty oil can damage, can, you know, can result from a bunch of different things, whether it's blocked or damaged or poor quality oil, uh, dirt being introduced during servicing, uh, and then, of course, engine wear and manufacturing debris can, can cause a lot of issues there, too. So it's just something to always check for um, whenever we're servicing vehicles with turbochargers, looking at maintenance records, making sure that oil changes are being done on time, because uh, just like the engine, you know, good, clean, quality flowing oil is critical to engine performance and longevity. Same thing holds true on turbochargers. And then failure from excessive exhaust temperatures or hot shutdown can absolutely cause a ton of damage to bearings um, and build up a lot of carbon. <clears throat> and what that looks like for us is when we think about hot shutdown, and, and I know a lot of customers that are driving vehicles today with turbochargers have never heard that term, but it's something we need to educate them on. And so the manufacturers say we should wait two or three minutes after stopping the vehicle before we shut it down. We all know that most customers are not going to do that, but if we can educate them and get them to wait 45 seconds, 60 seconds before shutting the vehicle down, we can alleviate a lot of issues like this behind me. So when we come to an idea of something like hot shutdown, the reality is this. Again, they're, they're coming up to about 100,000 RPMs at times. So let's say we were driving 65, 70 miles an hour. We slowed down to 45, 50 on a surface street. We get down to 30 on the side road. We pull into our driveway, our work, or the grocery store, or wherever it is, and we just shut the vehicle off. Well, that turbine and, and compressor wheel is still spinning at a high rate, thousands of RPMs. And it's okay at that moment because we still have engine oil lubricating at the top of the engine. If we just shut the engine off real fast, all that oil is going to drain back down. And now our turbine wheel has to try to slow down by itself without that lubricating oil trying to help it out. And so another thing, and I'll come back here, we got to make sure we have proper oil supply. So even if we're not doing hot shutdowns and we shut it down properly, we got to make sure that we don't have an issue with oil supply to the turbo. Because again, one of the most common reasons of failure on turbos is absolutely going to be lack of oil or dirty oil. Now, in this case, this comes off the same 1.6 EcoBoost as our solenoid that got cut. And again, because we didn't have a cover underneath, everything was susceptible to road damage. And that's the same story and the same truth here when it comes to the oil supply line for the turbo. Now, if we look on this side, if I hold it and pinch it in the middle, I can kind of move that braided line around and it's not a big deal. If I come over to this side, all I have to do is barely push my finger and boom, we have a complete kink and the hose. Now, luckily, the vehicle came in with this issue and it was repaired. And at the same time, we found this issue while we were in there. So this turbo was absolutely being starved of oil. We just got lucky that it didn't damage the turbo in the process. So we replaced this line as well. But anytime you have a vehicle that comes in 
that has uh, any type of turbo related issue and you notice that skid plate missing underneath the vehicle, let's check for things like cut hoses. Let's check for things like bent braided hoses because when we restrict that oil flow, we're absolutely gonna damage that turbo. Now I know there's no pressure involved here, but the same thing holds true on the return line for the turbocharger oil. Now, if we look at this side, again, this was all hit apparently by the same thing. We don't know what it was, but it hit it pretty good. If we look at this side, we can tell that the clamp is still holding on pretty well. The hose moves with the, the end of the, the hose here. The, the rubber hose moves with the end of the solid hose. On this side, however, when it got hit, it freed the metal hose up from the return hose, the, the rubber hose itself. Now, again, it's not under pressure, but this does allow for oil to leak from the system. And while it may not be an immediate problem, it can over time, if the customer's not paying attention to their oil level or the way the vehicle sounds and drives, we could lose enough oil to where nothing is being lubricated properly, including the engine and the turbo. So that's some pretty important notes when it comes to uh, oil lubricity, making sure we have good clean oil, making sure that the system is feeding the oil and returning the oil properly. Because again, those are some of the most common reasons that we have failures. But another extremely common reason, and we see more and more of this every day, especially with aftermarket air filters, compressor wheel damage and turbine damage. So we have to remember that anytime we have air coming in at an incredible rate of speed, and like I say, these things are spinning up to upwards of 100,000 RPMs, damage can occur. And I'll show you an example of that on the table here. This is not the correct filter for a six liter power stroke diesel. I think we can all agree on that. But this came off of a six liter power stroke diesel. And you can see how much damage has been done to it just by the force of the turbo pulling air through it. So we know this needs to be replaced with the original and proper air filter type. But if we look at another example here, we can see that cheap filters and turbos simply do not mix. We look at this one, we see on the top, we have the filter without a center cap, and we have the filter on the bottom with a center cap. Take a while, guess what happened to the center cap on the top picture? That's right, there was so much force being drawn in by the turbo, it sucked that metal cap through into the compressor wheel and absolutely destroyed this turbo. So we gotta make sure if we have a customer with a turbocharger that has an air intake system on the vehicle that they are using at least a quality air filter or being recommended they go back to a standard air filter assembly that the vehicle came with so that we can avoid debris coming through the system and destroying our compressor wheels like this. And so to recap, you know, we, we talked about a lot of different things very briefly, talked about the basic understanding of a turbo. We talked about VGT system, intercoolers. We talked about the wastegate system. But the thing I want you to take back with you for the recap is this. When we're looking at diagnosing, discussing with customers, turbocharger related uh, issues or concerns, we need to make sure they understand that we need clean, unrestricted airflow. We need adequate oil levels, unrestricted flow of oil and clean oil and we need proper wastegate functionality. So for customers that have those skid plates missing, might not be a bad idea to try to see if we can get them to jump back on and get a new skid plate replaced. So with that, here's Standard Motor Products. With the turbocharger program we have in place, there are a ton of features and benefits. That way, whenever you do replace a turbo, you know it's gonna stay there, it's gonna last, and it's not gonna come back. And that's why we put a three-year, 36,000-mile limited warranty on all of our turbos. All of our standard new turbos are quality tested to meet OEM quality and exceed in a lot of cases. We have a premium cast housing for superior durability and the rotating journal and thrust bearings are 100% quality tested. And then we also make sure that you have everything you need when the turbo is being replaced. A lot of times we know that we need these components because just on the other side of the wall of this studio, we actually have a vehicle test facility. And in that facility, we have technicians taking turbos and, and many other parts, ignition cools, every other kind of category you can think of. But if we're gonna make the part, we're gonna test the part. So we're not just bench testing these items, they're actually coming to our facility here, they're being installed, and our technicians are actually looking at what do we need to install this properly? What gaskets, what hoses, what seals, those kind of things. And so whenever we do have a system where you have a turbocharger come in and it needs five or six, seven, eight components, you're gonna find those components 
in the box with you because they've determined out there that we need this and we've tested this turbo and we know that it works properly when everything is done properly. So with that, I'll lead you and direct you to our YouTube page. If you go to YouTube and look up Standard Brand, you'll find well over 600 videos that are available for content very similar to this. And in a lot of cases, full-on installation videos on how to install certain things. You can see on the screen here, the first video I've got pulled up is Chevy Cruze turbocharger replacement. Just gives you the rundown on how to do the turbocharger replacement on that specific vehicle. I'll also direct you to standardbrand.com where you can see our e-catalog. A lot of training information is there. Uh, a lot of product knowledge is there, but you can also register for future Power Hour classes. The next one coming up is Wednesday, November 8th. We're going to be doing GDI technology. So make sure you register for that for 1215 p.m. Eastern and obviously 1115 a.m. Uh, Central Time. So with that, thank you for joining us for October's Power Hour on turbochargers. And I hope you learned something. I hope it gave you something to look at and something to think about whenever you have a turbocharger-related issue coming into your shops. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.